Okay, so we've downloaded unemployment data. And we'll go ahead and open it up and take a look at it. So, what we have here is unemployment data from 2006 to 2014 at the county level for the whole United States. Um, you see my favorite county here, which is Gov County, Kansas. That is the county I was named after. A roundabout sort of way. My great 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 grandma Phelps was crossing the plains. They stopped in Gut County, Kansas. They liked the name. I always thought that they had a son born there, but no. But I thought maybe he was conceived there. No, the timing's wrong. Uh, they liked the name. And so it's, it's so it's there. It's English in origin, of course, originally short for governor, but today in England it just means a boss, which I think is okay too. Uh, and so here's unemployment, here's some unemployment data for Gut County for 2006. So Suppose that you are, I don't know, working for the state of Kansas and you've got to build some charts that show what this data looks like over time. You've got, you've got, you know, for, maybe you've got a few counties. Maybe you've got to do this for a dozen counties. You want, you're doing some presentation, I don't know what it is. Maybe you're comparing dry counties, because it's a dry county. You can't buy alcohol here in Gov County. You're comparing unemployment in dry counties to non-dry counties in Kansas. I don't know. But you need to be able to chart this data. So what I've got to chart is I've got for Gov County, I've got to pull this number. See, one of these is a percentage. I've got to pull this number off of this sheet. I've got to find the corresponding number on this sheet and pull it, the corresponding number on the next sheet and pull it. And so I've got this, this data is not ready to chart. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to use some loops to be able to get this data ready to chart. Here we go. Let's do it. So in so doing, I'm going to go ahead and add a new sheet. And I'm going to put the sheet at the very first sheet, and I'm going to call it charts. C-H-A-R-T-S. <coughs> okay, so what I'm going to want is, I'm going to want this to start in 2006. I'm not anticipating getting data before 2006, but I don't want to have a fixed end. In other words, if I add another worksheet for 2015, 2016, 2017 in here, and I run the data again, I would like it to build those out. And so that's and so that, that's why I'm not just going to hard code these dates in, because as these sheets come in, I might need to be able to get more dates in. So let's go ahead and open up our code window. Well, I think I already have a module here. There's a module called Mod Loops. And so we'll work inside this module, this pre-existing module. And I'll make another sub-procedure called Make Chart. Couple different ways that we can do this. Why don't we? Why don't we? Why don't we take the same? We can at least do this for two, and we can kind of see how how the loops are similar and different from each other. So let me do this first with the. No, I think I'm going to do forty. Let's start with forty. We've seen the do loop a couple of times, but let's now look at a new loop. So there's the, the do loop that we've seen. Start with the keyword do, end with the keyword loop. Is a general purpose mother of all loops. Anything you need to do with a loop, you could do with a do loop. There really is nothing more that, that, you, that you could do. But there are some things that we so often, some patterns that we implement so often that we just say, you know, it would be nice if we had a loop that was designed for this. So we wouldn't have to do as much extra work taking the general purpose loop and making it do this particular case. And one of those one of those really common things is to say I have a variable that I need to move across a range. Meaning, I need to execute for row 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I, I've got some variable, or, uh, or only even numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. It's so common that we need to change that value and then do something again, except it's all the same except for that value, and then change it again and do something again that we have a loop specifically wired for. The do loop requires nothing else. There's, there's nothing outside of a loop structure that you need. You can say do and loop and you're done. But the for loop requires what's called a control variable. So I'm just going to dim, why don't I call it yr as an integer. This is the, this is the control variable, it's called the control variable for the loop. It's an ordinary variable at this point, but we're going to use it in a way that will make it a control variable. For the for next loop. 
Now here's the structure. Four, and then we give it some the control variable. And we immediately say where the variable starts. Before the four, let me put it here. If I just said yr equals 2006, you would look at that and you would say, that's an assignment statement. You're putting what's in the right-hand side of the equal sign into what's on the left-hand side. You're setting the value, the value of the variable yr. You see that? Now we're going to take that same idea and put it in a loop. For, and this, this part here now says that's the initial value. That's the starting value of this variable. The first thing this loop is going to do is it's going to make yr equal to 2006. And then we tell it how far we're willing to take it to some ending value. For right now, let's call it 2014. We're going to make that dynamic. For now, I want you to see it in this loop. End of the loop here now is next. Next says, in the do loop, the keyword loop at the end of the variable says, at the end of the loop, says, go back to the top. That's all it does. The next statement does two things. It, it does say, go back to the top of the loop, but it says, change the control variable to its next value. And so it's going to add one onto yr. So if I do nothing more than debug.print yr, It's now going to print, the, the first time in this loop, it is going to print whatever YR is. YR is 2006, it's going to print 2006. Next, is going to add one onto YR. It'll come and check, are we bigger than 2014? No, we're 2007. And so it's going to print 2007. And it'll add one, 2008, 2009, 2010. And so if I run that, we should see it print everywhere from 2006 to 2014. Let's go back to think of this just when I said it's just printed 2013. <coughs> it hits next, it changes YR to what? 2014. Comes back up to the top of the, at, at the loop and it asks, is YR out of this boundary yet? And it goes, no, it's not out of that boundary. It's still, it's still in the range, 2006 to 2014. It prints 2014. It hits next. What does next do? It makes it 2015 comes back and it checks this again, it goes, oh, it's outside of that boundary. We're done. And then it's done with the loop. So what is YR when this loop is over? Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's outside of this range. In fact, the reason it quits the loop is because it got outside of that range. So if I print, we are out of the loop, and YR is, now, we can't make YR on here now. I'll run this again. It'll still print the 2006 through 2014, but now it tells us, yes, yeah, 2015. So that's that's one thing that seems a little bit unusual when you're first working with this loop is that the control variable actually goes out of bounds. But the loop doesn't execute while it's out of bounds. It goes out of bounds and it goes, okay, we're done. So, so the loop is never going to print it there, but it will actually be above 214 when, or 2014 when it's done. So far, so good? <coughs> okay, so now let's actually read, instead of having this part <coughs> fixed, we want to figure out how far it's going to go. So any place I can put an expression, just like a, a constant, I can put something that calculates to a particular value. So I could put here 2,000 plus 14. This is a weird thing to do. But this is just to show that, that this will get evaluated to 2014 and it will execute exactly the same as it did before. It's just to show that I can put something more than just a single number here. I could put something that will get evaluated. I could put a variable here. Let's declare a variable. Dim last year as an integer. Last year equals 20. And now loop until last year. Again, same thing. Right? Just a variable instead of constant. But now the magic part here is no, 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 no. I want to read off the worksheet and find out what my last sheet is. What's the name of my last sheet? Because I'm putting a year number as the sheet names. 
just want to read the last sheet and see what it is. So to do that, let me let me take a little bit of a, a little bit of a longer approach to get there. Let me do an S as a worksheet. This is an object variable. Remember, an object variable is just going to hold a reference to another object. It allows me to kind of make a nickname for some object. And I will set S equal to, out of all the worksheets, I want the one, I want the last worksheet. How do I say it? How do I tell it I want the last worksheet? Remember, I could put in here one, or I could put in here ten or something. I, I put the count of something, so I will put worksheets.count. Worksheets.count tells me how many worksheets there are. And so if I want worksheet number, worksheets.count, it's the very last, it's the rightmost tab. The question here in the middle? Uh, so would you ever, uh, does VBA support negative numbers to go from the right? Oh, so just instead of putting in here a number one, put in here worksheets, negative one. Yeah, that's a, that's a thing. The only place I've ever seen that before is in Python. It's really handy. Uh, and let me just... Let me be sure it doesn't work. I'm 99.7% sure that it's not going to work, but I've never tried it. Be, I, would be, I would be delighted if it does. If I ask for worksheets.one.name, it tells me the name. So if I was doing the same idea in Python, if I said negative one, it would go, well, you don't want the one, the first one from the beginning, you want the first one from the end. Yeah, it, just doesn't, it doesn't like it. So it's no good. It's a no good. Now I'm more than 99.7%. Question. So uh, I have a question like why do you deem why R as integer instead of like a variant? Why declare why R as an integer instead of as a variant? I could have declared it as a variant. <coughs> but I'm only anticipating that it's going to pick one of these numbers. It's going to be a number in the range between 2006 and some year. So variant would work, but Variant is going to cost me an extra 22 bytes just for taking it out of the just for taking it out of the of the stable, out of the garage. There's overhead there that I prefer not to not to have. Other thing about variant is that because it can behave in different ways, here's the thing. If I have an integer variable and I plug a string into it, what's going to happen? If I say, you know what, here's, a, here's an integer variable. Put this string into the integer variable. What's the interpreter going to do? You might say it's going to have an error. And if the string is something like, here's a number variable, and the string is Nephi, it's going to go, I don't know how to make Nephi into a number. I mean, maybe there's some Hebrew thing where Nephi means some number. But the interpreter doesn't know that. But what the interpreter will do is if I have a string, if I have a, if I have a, if a variable like YR, it's a numeric variable, and I set it equal to 2006, that's good, that'll be fine. But if I set it equal to a string 2006, most computer languages <coughs> would say, yeah, you can't do that, no go. VBA goes, well, I think I know what you're talking about. I can look at that string and go, I know the number he means. He doesn't mean seven. What number do I mean? 2006, and the interpreter will make that conversion for me. And I'll know that I have a number. But if I had this type variant, it wouldn't. It, it, it wouldn't make it into a number. It would leave it as a string. So it's safer to do anything <laughs> as integer instead of like a variant? It is always safer to use anything but variant. OK. That's wow. right. <laughs> Sometimes variant is your only choice, depending on what you're going to do. Oh, I want to do this. It's got to be variant. <coughs> Once you talk about arrays, I'll give you an example of that. Of what an array we have done. question over here? Okay, so that's why I make it an integer. So now I'm not, so, so I'm binding S onto this worksheet, and now watch this. Instead of putting this to a number, I'm going to say I want S dot. No. That's not what I want to do. Sorry. Let's just do it this way. Forget S. We're going to use S again in just a minute. Let's not use it now. Worksheets.count. That refers to the last worksheet. I want the name of this one. Yes, I just want to equal worksheets name charts. We call it chart or charts? Or shirts. There are 
are some misspellings that are more deadly than others. <laughs> I don't think I've told you this. It is by far the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me in class. My face must have turned the color of my robe. Before I was born in the room, I was a doctoral student. I was teaching a class. It was the late 90s. The world was different in the late 90s. I needed to direct my students to be able to find some file compression software, which now comes as a part of the operating system. You just zip a file up. In the 90s, no, you had to go download software. I was trying to tell someone, but someone in the class said, you can get that at shareware.com. And that sounded really reasonable, like a really reasonable thing to type in. Except the University of Minnesota, they don't have any filters on their internet. I typed in shareware.com. I left the E off. I went to a hardcore pornography site. <laughs> I tried to go back. You can't go back. <laughs> I tried to close the browser. You can't close the browser. It comes right back. The class is rolling. On the floor. <laughs> I finally pulled the plug on the computer. That's going to stop it. It came back. No, it didn't. <laughs> So I don't feel too bad about typing charts. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh, I forgot what we were. It was a vivid memory. So, okay. Set s equal to. Okay, yeah. So we're going to use this here in a second. So now I'm going to go from last year. Last year, now I was going to read the thing. The last year. Now this is going to assume. That the rightmost sheet is my ending sheet. So if I add a new sheet for 2015, it needs to be in order for this to work. That's an assumption about how this code is going. But now this should do the same thing. This should still run right up through uh, 2014. Does the 2014 out of the loop? It tells us the rightmost. Okay. So now what I'd like to do on my chart sheet, maybe starting here, right here in row four, I would like to put 2006, 2007, 2008. And up to however many <coughs> sheets we've read in. So I'm going to need some other variable to keep track of which row I'm writing out to. And so let me declare another variable as an integer, again, r as an integer. And just before the loop, let me set r equal to 4. And then inside the loop, maybe instead of printing out my year, I will say, my worksheet S, so I have now bound the S variable onto the charts worksheet. There, this is now two different ways to get to the location in memory where the charts worksheet is. One is to say worksheets chart. I do that, and Excel looks at that and goes, i got to find out, apparently there's some worksheet here named charts. It goes, oh yeah, there it is. I see it. I've got to find where it is in memory. It goes, okay, that's the reference to that, that object. That's where that is. But I have another way to get to it now. After this, I can just say S. S just is a, is a faster way to get there. How much faster? Three or four nanoseconds. The speed at which this happens is not significant. The fact that my code is going to look more readable because I've got that S there is good. So now I can just say S, it refers to that sheet, dot cells. I think it's going to be the first time we've used the cells method. So let's, let me come up here and just demonstrate it for a minute in the immediate window. So if I say cells in parentheses, I tell it row number four, column number two, that should be cell number B4. That's for the address, there it is. So we've used range to refer to an individual cell or to refer to a multi-cell range. But now we can use cells, it's kind of similar, but instead of giving it an address like B4, I give it two numeric indices. I give it row number and column number. That'll be really handy when I'm working with a loop. Ah. So, cells, which row do I want to write to? Row number R, column number one. And I want to put the value, I want to change the value property. So instead of instead of putting, instead of writing out to my window, 2006, 2007, 2008, I'm going to write to row number four, column one, 2006. Next time through, I'm going to write to row number four, column one, 2007, 2008. I haven't done anything to change R. R is only going to be four. I've got to do something here. But right now, it's just going to write it right over the top of the cell. So if I run it, I should only see 2014 left over in that cell A4. But it did. It wrote 2006 and then 2007. I need to make it so that it writes 2006, then 2007 here, 2007 here, uh, and, and so forth. 
complete pattern. So what do I have to do inside this loop? Yeah, let's increment r. r equals what it used to be, plus 1. So now, the first time through the loop, it will be 4. We'll make it 5. The next time we hit it, it'll be 5. We'll make it 6. 6, we'll make it 7. So I only get one control variable, and I'm using the control variable to go across the sheets. So I've got to increment any other variables I need to increment by hand inside this loop. But now when I run this, it should give me that data right here in the worksheet. So far, so good. Now, let's say we're going to bring that we're going to bring the information in for like Baldwin County, Alabama. Baldwin County is row number four. That's Baldwin County. And so let's do this. That's what I'm going to put in column one. What am I going to put in column two? Well, that's going to be out of all the worksheets, <coughs> one named. What's the name of the worksheet I'm after? The first time through this, I want to pull the unemployment data from row number, uh, I'm sorry, from which worksheet? When, when I write 2006 in column one, which sheet should I be looking at in, in for this data? Okay, my 2006 sheet. So I'm going to put YR here. Maybe there's a little problem, we'll deal with it. Worksheet YR dot cells. Row number, oops, dot cells. Row number, what did I say it was? Four. Mm -hmm. You know what, we're changing from, we're changing from Baldwin, we already got a four in the unit. Let's go to bid. I'd go to, no, let's go to bar, Barber. I can say Barber, that's row number five. So row number five, column number, mm -hmm. I'm after the unemployment rate, so that's column number G. Now G is letter, seventh letter in the alphabet, so I can put a seven there, but, this actually allows me to put a letter reference to the column as well. The thing that's a little bit problematic here is that when you say a letter and a number, you're used to saying G5. And these indices are exactly backwards, right? This is row, column. Anytime you have an ordered pair that refers to a cell, anywhere in Excel, it's always row, column. But if you've got a letter and a number, it's typically column, row. Sorry, I'm not a good excuse for that. And I am going to read the value of that. Okay, so what this should do is this should give us an error, but we'll, once we fix the error, what it should do is it should pull from the 2006 sheet, it's going to look at row 5, column G, and it's going to bring that value and it's going to put it in the second column. So next to the 2006, in column 1, in column 2, we're going to put the unemployment rate for 2006. So far, so good. Here's the problem. Let's just, let me just ask for worksheet number 2006's name. So worksheets 2006.name. What's that going to print? Subscript out of range. Why? Aha! When I refer, to, when I have a collection and I give it a, an, an integer value here, what does it do? I am looking for the 2006 worksheet. How many are there? There's like 10. And it's saying there's, there's no 2006 worksheet. Now, what happens if I pass it a string? It goes, oh, we're looking for a name. And that one it can figure out. The problem is this YR here is an integer. I define it as an integer, it's a numeric value. And so when I plug it in here, it, it, it assumes we're talking about the numeric, and that's good. But I can't figure that out. Fortunately, there's a function that I can use to convert a number into a string. It's called CSTR, convert to string. And I'll just wrap CSTR right around this argument. And now that's going to be the string version of it, and that's okay. It gets a string, it knows what to do when it gets a string. Look for one that has that name. Oh, there's the name. So I'll do the same thing around this YR here. I'm going to have to say convert string. And now when I run that, it should, over here on my chart sheet, it should put the Barber County unemployment rate for each one of these years. The only thing I need now is to put 
the word Barber County right there and be ready to build a chart for it. So let me go ahead and do that. So that's row three, column two. Maybe just before I come in here to the loop, let's go ahead and write that. So S dot cells, row number three, column number two, dot value equals. And let's assume. Oh, let's just pull it off. Let's pull it off of worksheet number 2006. So sheets, worksheets, and quote 2006. Dot cells. Where is it? The name of the county is in column three. Yeah, it's in column three. So we're going for we're going for Barber County. That's going to be row. Right now, it'll be row five, column three. So row five, column three. We're going to we're going to generalize this in just a minute. But for right now, let's just pull that value. <coughs> I've run that now on my chart sheet. I've got Barber County, Alabama. I'll go back to the code in just a second. Let me go ahead and build the chart. And insert a scatter plot. Colon. Your county still has to be covered by 2014. Wow, we're still way up here, 11.11% unemployment. <laughs> Tough county to live in. Out in Spain. What's the unemployment rate for the young people in Spain right now? Okay. So that's pretty good. Except now what I'd like, I'd like to be able to give the user a way to pick the county to build the chart for. How can the user pick the county? How can we tell the user to pick the county? A question or a solution? Solution. Aha! Uh -huh. Yes. We can, like in the code, reference a cell where they put. Okay, so one thing we could do is we could say type in the name of the county you want, and then we could go find that county. That's possible. I'm lazier than that. That's a little bit of work. Go ahead. I mean, my created a message box for us. Input, input box. box, type it in. Still, they're going to type it in. we got to find it. They're going to type it in wrong. What do we do then? <laughs> we do a drop down list. We do a drop down list. That would all work. That is way easier to do. Yeah? Yeah, why don't you choose the cell you want and then run the code? You want Barber County? Great. Come over here. I don't care which one you're on, any one of these. You go to Barber County, run the code. You want Bullock County? Run the code when it's here. This is really easy, but now all we have to do is we have to say when this thing runs, let's look at the active cell and see what row it's on. So let's do this. Let's come in here and let's say dim, we'll call it data row, the row we're getting the data from. We'll call it number one. Or data row, R H O. <laughs> Maybe in a row as a long. I'm going to use. I'm, I'm going to use. Oh, actually, anywhere I'm referring to a row, I should get in the habit of using a long. It costs me an extra byte that I don't need, but at some point, if you're in the habit of using long, it's going to save your butt because you're going to be doing something. You'd be if you ever get really used to writing integer when you're referring to a row. What's the problem? You get a data set with more than 32,767 rows, and as soon as you cut into that next row, it's going to go overflow. How many rows are possible in Excel currently? 1.04 million. So we're going to use long because it's plus or minus 2 million. We're good. <laughs> it costs, so it costs me an extra byte when I'm using it in a range less than 32,000. But my feeling is if it's a reference to a row, it should be of the handle of rows value. And so I'm going to use long. So now, somewhere here before we refer to it, we're going to say data row equals active cell dot row. I can ask, active cells are reference to a range. I can ask for the row that the range is on. It's on row number whatever the active cell is. So now, everywhere down here where I had row number five, I'm just going to change that to data row. So here's where I'm reading the name of the county. Here's where I'm reading the unemployment. So I think I'm on Bibb County. So if I run this now, I should have my, or I was on Bullock County. So my chart should now be for Bullock County. There's Bullock County. Bullock County is doing better. They're below 10%. They're below 9.5%. Better than our last county was. Okay, let's do this too. Let's do one more thing. And then we'll put a hot, put a shortcut key on it. 
just so we can get the feeling that it's kind of useful. At the, so I guess I don't need this debug dot print anymore. I'll leave this comment out. Uh, but now let me just go ahead and activate the chart sheet. S dot select. Select or activate, either one will do. S, I've already bound S onto my charts sheet up here. So S is just a nickname for the chart sheet. And so I should be able to select it. So now when I run it, I'm going to come here and choose 2006. Come here to Cherokee County, run my code. And it should now select charts when it's done and show me that the Cherokee paid hey, 6%. Let's move it over. Now let's just let's just assign a shortcut key to it. So let me come to my developer tab, my list of macros. Here's make chart, developer macros, make chart. Don't run it, it'll just run it again. Instead, I'm going to come to options and I'm going to assign control C for chart. Wait a minute. Control C? Anymore, it makes the chart. So what am I going to put here? Capital C. We'll put a comment there if I want to. So now I come over here to 2009. Doesn't matter which one I'm on. I choose Macon County, Control Shift C, and here's the chart for Macon County. Come over here, choose Gov County. Control Shift C, and there's Gov. Ooh, it's a double peak. That's they had a double bit recession in Gov County. Kept saying it's going to be a double bit recession. They were right. Okay, that's the four next loop. Oh, a couple more things that I forgot to kind of show you while we were at it. Let's do this. Let's let's start off. I'm trying to think what this is going to do to my chart. Let me start off by clearing off those first two columns. I think this will be okay. Uh, let's see, I bound to S here. Let's do it right here. Right, right after I bind to S, I'm going to say S dot range, and then I'm going to do columns A through B. Do you know how to do that in range notation? Capital A, column, capital A, colon, capital B. That's a range from column A to column B. I'm going to set the value of that range. Hmm. I'm sure what's going to happen. If I clear this, let's try clear. I'm not sure if that's going to disconnect the chart from the range or not. What I'm about to show you, I want to get rid of this data. So we're going to start by clearing that data. I'm going to run this and see if the chart, see if it's ruined my chart. It may have disconnected the chart. Oh no, it's still there. Please. So it's it's clearing off all the data from here and then it's rebuilding that. So the point is that I want to be able to show you one other option here on the four next loop, and it's right here. There's, there's really one more thing I can do here, and that is I can add something to count besides one. If I set step two here, this now controls what gets added to the key when we hit next. The default would be step one, add one. Now, every time we hit next, we're going to add what? Add two to the control variable. So if I run this, it should now only show me. That was really unexpected. But. We got here 2006, 2008. Oh, it's because what the active cell was. My active cell was somewhere that didn't have any business being. Let me put my active cell back here, Control Shift C. There we go. So now I'm only getting data every other year. Because when I hit next, instead of adding one, I'm adding two. So I, I, I get 2006 sheet first, <coughs> I add two, my next one's 2008. You see that? Is someone going to try to add a negative number? They hear negative number. If you want to do this as a negative number, you kind of invert that chart and put the negative numbers, the, the large numbers at the top. Let me go ahead and I'm going to comment this line out so we can bring it back easily now. In this case, I'm going to go from last year to 2006. I'm reversing the order of the numbers and I'm going to step by negative one. Uh, last year, year, last year to 2006. So if, if, if I'm starting at a larger number that I'm ending at, then to go across that range, I've got to add a negative <coughs> one, or I've got to subtract one each time. So that's what we said, next. And so now that should, it should still do exactly the same thing, but it should just put the data in opposite order. 
for now, the 2014 is here, 2006 is here, but it's smart enough to, the chart is still smart enough to figure <coughs> out to put the 2006 in ascending order here. It's smart. It's a smart chart. So if you're going to step in a, a negative direction, then you've got to have your indices reversed. So you're going from a larger number to a smaller number. Questions? Yes. How did you set the shortcut key again? To set the shortcut key on this, I came to my developer tab and my list of macros. Okay. Once I've got the list of macros, I select the one I want. It's already selected because there's only one. And then I choose options, and that's where I'm going to set. Thanks. Question here? So which options uh, on, on, um, on the micro, macro is the quick chart? Which line on here to go? That, Oh, well the question is, where do I create the chart in this macro? And the answer is, the macro is not getting created in the chart. I built this chart by hand. And then just the fact that I've changed the data in here, let's put a 25% interest rate in here. Then this chart goes, oh, the data's changed, and the chart automatically adjusts itself to match its <coughs> Oh, okay. So it's not run by the macro. The chart is not created by the macro. All the macro does is pull the data that I'm after. And the chart is updating itself. So we, we will see how to create charts with macros. It is more difficult than you might think. Um, it's, it's, it, that's not right. It's more involved than you might think. It's really not that hard, but there's, there's more to it than just, oh, let's record myself creating a chart. I see the code. I'm ready to go. Oh, no. It's a little more, it's a little more involved. But fear not, my children. I will take you. Okay, that's the four next loop. That really is just about all there is to the four next loop. Let's come look at our four, uh, our do loop again. We've seen the do loop, but we've never really talked through it. We've, uh, so far I said, well, just believe this code. And so now let's look at an example. So let me do a sub for the do loop demo. For next loop says I am going. I've got I've got to work across a range. I've got values that I've got to go from one number to another number. I could be going up or down. I could be adding two or seven or one <coughs> or negative one, depending on how I'm configured. So when, I, when I've got a for next loop, it says I'm iterating across a range of numbers, of integer values. The do loop says I'm going to do something and then check to see if I should do something else. Let's see if I should do it again. And then after I've done it, I'm going to check. Should I still be doing this? So the do loop, when I see a do loop, it, it says to me, it's, it's not knowable how many times this loop's going to execute. At the time we're writing this, we, we just don't know. And so that's what the do loop is for. So let's look at something that, that we just don't know. I'm going to come to the command prompt. Some of you will be like, oh, the command prompt, I've heard of this. <laughs> when I started with computers, this is all the computer was. It was a command prompt. You looked at it and you went, hmm, what could I do? Uh, see what files are here? Yeah, they are. Yeah, oh, there's some files here. Let me come into, uh, let me come to like my documents. You don't need to do this with me. I'm just, I'm just trying to give you some background for this. So DIR, here's a bunch of documents. Let me do a DIR of star dot XLSM. Now what I'm seeing is only I'm seeing only the XLSM files. Just wrapping here a little bit, so stand by for a second. I'm going to make the font a little smaller. There we go. So now, here's the list. DIR star dot XLSM. So these are all of the files that end in XLSM. So if I'm working at the command prompt and I want to see what are all the files that meet a particular wildcard, I can just ask that and it shows up. I got to tell you, when I first started with this, when you said DIR, the computer was so slow, you had time to read the directory as it went across the screen. The first time we got a computer that you couldn't read the directory as you did it, we were like, oh, <laughs> There's a similar statement right here in VBA. It's called DIR. 
Here's how it works. Read down, file name, but it's a little bit weird. It goes back to the 1970s. Okay, so there, there are times, there are times when you say, listen, in fact, there'll be times in this class, we've got a project that says, I'm going to give you a folder that's got a bunch of Excel files in it. You don't know how many files there are, but you've got to process every last one of them. This is going to be helpful. So I'm going to say file name equals, and you know what? I'm going to I'm going to save this workbook in my documents. So select so it in that location. Save as. Where am I going to put this? Where do we get to my documents? Oh, I didn't already get my documents. Oops, sorry. Oh, it's already there. Never mind. I'm going to replace it. No, it's already there. Okay, good. That's what. In fact, watch this. I can ask this. I want to say this workbook dot path p a t h. That should just tell me where this workbook is located. I can ask the workbook where it's been saved. <coughs> so I'm going to say file name equals dir. In parentheses, I got to tell it the path that I want to ask for the files about. And so that'll be this workbook dot path. But I'm going to concatenate onto that a backslash and then a star dot xlsm. So this will now give me, it will return back the list, it will go and find the list of all the files at that location that end in xlsm. But it will send back only the first one. So now if I do a debug dot print or file name, it should just give me one file name. Run this. There's my file name. Book one dot dash backup dot xlsm. Probably a very important workbook. Draw it back to that. Now watch this. I'm going to say file name equals dirt. But I'm not going to tell it where to look. And when I do that, it goes, oh, you just want the next one from the list. So now I should, it should print, should, should, should print this one and should print a different one. Well, I've got to see if you look at print now. Now I've got two. If I tell it to give a file name dot dir again, it should bring back the next file. So now I've got, I've got three dir statements. One tells it where to go, and the rest just say give me the next file. That should give me three files. Once I'm done, once I get to the end of the list, it will send me back one zero link string. That's how I'll know I'm done with the list, with a zero link string. If I ask again after I got that zero link string, it's an error. We're done. I've given you all I can give you. You've asked for more. I have nothing else to give you. I won't do it. So here's the point. I, there's no way for me to know how many files there are, except to process one and then ask, is there another one? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get the file name, and then I'm going to say do, and then loop around one of these. I'll get rid of the others that I had done. Now if I run this, uh, it, should, it should print them all off, and eventually I'll get an error. And I'll end that, that's fine. So here's all the files that are printed off. Here's my backup, my book one, book three, whatever. Came down to web query, whatever, 2017, there it is. It then printed a zero length string, and then I got to the error. So I can do this, now I'll have a way out of this loop until file name <coughs> equals a zero length string. So now it should go through and print off that same set, except it won't print the zero length string and it won't have the error. This is what the do loop is really wired for. It's to say, I don't know how many there are, I really don't ask how many there are, just do the loop and check. Which one's more efficient, do loop or the for loop? For loop is 
marginally more efficient because it doesn't check the evaluations every time. <laughs> so if I've got some expression that we're trying to figure out, we're looping until this condition, it checks that condition once, and then it doesn't check that again. If I did, if I built a, something similar to the for loop using a do loop, which I could do, it has to check that condition every single time. Am I worried about that kind of efficiency? <coughs> probably not. We're talking about milliseconds. We're probably not worried about, even for the stuff that we do with Excel, we're probably not worried about that kind of efficiency. Yeah, let's talk about that. So the question is, sometimes we've seen the exit clause not at the bottom, but at the top. What's the difference if I put it at the top? There's only one difference. The only difference is that if the, if the do loop, if the, if the exit clause is at the top, then as I come into the loop, before I ever execute the loop at all, it says, check to see if I should be executing the loop. If it, if, it, if it doesn't have a clause there, it never tries to think, should I execute the loop? It runs through all this, and then at the end of the loop, it asks, should I execute the loop? The tendency to think is that if I'm, if I'm just starting the issue, you'll say, oh, so it's at the loop, the loop's going to execute one more time than if it's at the top. No. They execute exactly the same number of times, except you're guaranteed to execute once if the execute clause is at the bottom. If I get all the way through here, What's, what happens next right after this? What's the very next thing that processes? Right up here. And so this, this really is, whether I put it here or whether I put it here, they really are one right after each other. There's no other code that executes between those two points. The only difference is am I guaranteed to come to the thing? And in this case, I probably want it at the top because, let's say I, I'm looking for something that doesn't exist. MLSM, that's like a multi-level sales market. <laughs> and so, if I so we'll watch this, I'm going to run this, and, and I'm going to run this. There's nothing executed. It didn't find any files that met that criteria. It didn't have an error. It didn't put a right line. It just said, oh, yeah, there's none. It's already none. This, this brought back a zero length string. This is a zero length string. I said, we're done. We don't execute all that. We don't execute the loop at all. Got it? With a do loop, there's one more thing you probably should always put into it, and that's this keyword right here, do events. What do events does is it says, let's talk about what do events isn't thing. When you put your computer into a loop, if you forget to give it away out of the loop, let's say I just forgot this file name equals zero, or worse yet, if I, I spell the file name wrong, F I E L N A N equals dir, my control exit is looking at file name, I'm suddenly changing some different variable, but not file name, then this thing's never going to get out. It's a small typo that would, that would put this into an endless loop. We asked, how do I get out of the endless loop? And the answer is, you don't. That's why they call it endless. It, there's no way out. And the reason there's no way out is because you've given your computer something to do. That, that interpreter. You think about it. Excel is used all over the world. By, by probably by millions of people. How many of them use the interpreter? What'd you say? 1%? Probably not even 1%. So for the vast majority of that interpreter's life, it's sitting around there going, what's this to do? I've got nothing to do. You gave it something to do. Yeah, it's a loop. And you look at it, that's a really stupid thing to do. And it goes, it goes, no, I'm doing it. I, I don't know when I'm going to get a chance to do this again. I'm doing it. And I don't care if someone's trying to get my attention. I'm not looking up because I got something to do and I'm doing it. Darn it. And it really doesn't. You could be trying, you could be jumping, you could be pounding your computer. Listen to me. And it's going, I can't hear you. I'm doing this. And I've got something else to do. I can't hear you. Unless you tell it, listen, every time through this loop, why don't you just listen for a moment and see, am I trying to get your attention? And the way you do that is with a statement called do events. That's right here. The do event says, hey, when you execute this, it just says, look, yeah, I know you can only do one thing at a time, Excel, but at this point, pause what you're doing, and just look up and see if someone clicked on the pause button, because I'd like you to pause. Without that do event, it will never look up and see, should I pause? So you can be pounding that, and it'll just go, yeah, no, I did. So, uh, okay. I, I'm going to comment out the part where we change the file name, and I'm going to run it. <laughs> We never get past that first one, right? We've set, we've set book one. Uh, we set file name for the book one, and we never changed it. And we're 
going to continue to do this until final name is blank. Is it ever going to be blank? That's not going to be blank. Uh, there's nothing we can do to cause that to be blank. We have to go delete all the files. Does that change it? Delete all the files? No, because it's not looking anymore. We have to go to my operating system and delete the files. I can do that. But now, because that do events is there, if I hit pause, we go, okay, that's fine. Where did it stop? On the do events. Is that a coincidence? That's no coincidence. Because that's the point where it says, let me take a look. <laughs> Ready again? It's going to stop there every time. That's the only place that it can that, that it's safe. Did someone press pause? Yeah. How does that affect like processing speed? How does it affect processing speed in the Windows environment? It's it's negligible. I can't notice a difference. It probably does because it takes some processing cycles to look and see if it's been tested. It's not happening. In the Mac, the last time I timed it, it was like, how come this code's running so slow? I couldn't figure it out. And I started getting rid of stuff. I finally got rid of the do events and it went fast again. Oh. In the Mac, it could be very expensive, but in Windows, it's negative. Um, sometimes, if Excel doesn't, if, if your if your editor doesn't have to be active, you can't even get it to show. Fortunately, there's a keystroke that will do it. But you'll notice over here on pause, it says press Control Break. So that's Control here and the keyboard Break. It's right up here. Sadly, most of your computers don't have a break key on your laptop. It's just not there. It's like, listen, you know, we've only got 90 keys to work with here. Something's got to go. No one needs the break key, really. You need the break key. So, so sometimes you can't get back here. Hopefully, you have a break key. If you don't, what do you do? Go get a keyboard, plug it in, put the break key. Uh, you might be able Please to activate keyboard. this. Yeah. There's some on screen keyboard that might be able to. Control function D, though. Control what? Oh, maybe. There may be another way to get to the break key. Yeah, uh, not for me. Okay. So, um, so that's it. If you, if you, if you're saying do until, you're going to execute until this condition is true. If you change this to do while, which you can, you're going to do while it's true. It's just whether you're executing while it's uh, until it's true or until it's false. So you have while or until, depending on whether your condition is true or false. It's syntactic sugar, you could always just put not around this and it would behave the same. So do until this is the same as do while not this. Okay, one more loop to cover in the next couple of minutes. And okay, so remember that the do loop is a general purpose, you, know, you can do anything with it loop. We really could set up our own variables, we can add one to the bottom, we can make it do exactly what the do loop does. But we say, you know, there's some things we do a whole lot of. Like iterating a variable across a range is something we do a whole lot of. There's something else we do a whole lot of. <coughs> Excuse me. Speaking of typos, uh, uh, let's do the, the for each loop. There's another thing we do a whole lot of, and that is iterating across all of the objects in a collection. We got a collection of sheets here. I want to see the names of all the sheets. I can use a for each loop. The for next loop takes a variable across a range, a numeric variable across a range. The for each loop takes an object variable and binds it individually to each object in the collection. Let me show you. Dim s as a worksheet, just like we had before. Right? That's what we did down here when we had our worksheet that we were using s dot uh, s dot range s dot cells. So now we are going to say for s equal for I'm sorry for each s in worksheets. Worksheets is a collection. It's a collection of worksheets. S, what kind of variable is it? It's an object variable, but specifically it's only allowed to bind onto other worksheet objects. And so the first time through this loop, s is going to be bound on to the first object in this collection. What's the first object in this collection? It's my, it's my sheet called charts. And so if I said debug.prints.name, the first time through, S will be bound onto the chart sheet and it's going to print chart. The next time it'll be bound onto 2006, then 2007, 2008. This should print charts, and then 2006 through 2014. Charts, 2006, then 2014. This one. Again, this is something we do a lot. I want to do something to every object in this collection. Can I do this in the do loop? 
yeah, we're going to add some of this in text around. Say, okay, S is going to bind on to the next one in this collection. Uh, can I do the for loop? Yeah, I can do for x equals 1 to the collection dot count. And then I can refer to it by its index number. That's all fine. But we said we do this so often. Let's make a loop that just does it for us. We don't have to add the code that manipulates the collection. How are we with this loop? I was thinking I probably didn't have time to cover it, but I probably have two minutes. We got two minutes to go. Questions? We have just two minutes to go. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do if you, if you don't add the do events? Oh, what, a, what do I do if I didn't have do events? The answer is restore from backup. Uh, there is no way to get into it. You, you might very well, it's back. You might very well. <laughs> You know, try to click that for a while, try control break, try you know, plug in three or four different keyboard, try control break all at the same time, try to get your buddies involved. Hey, let's really hit this. Uh, and I don't know, it seems like every once in a while that has worked for me. But really what you do is you kill Excel. And uh, hopefully it has done an auto save recently enough that you haven't lost too much. Question in the back of the room. Yeah. Wait. Uh, roll up another Oh, here. So, in a lot of other languages, you don't need to dim S before we get here. You could just, just do it here. And the answer is, if I don't have option explicit here, I can do it without it. But, uh, did we talk about option explicit? Yeah. What's it without? In our last minute, option explicit in a compiler directive or, or an interpreter directive, it says, tells the interpreter, look, when you look at this code, if you see a variable name that I haven't de de declared with a dim statement, that's a mistake. Because I, I'm declaring all my variables. This says, is requiring me to explicitly declare all of my variables. It is, it is the spell checker for your variable names. So you come here and you say, declare your variable name as some name. And then if you spell it differently somewhere else, and you don't have option explicit, the interpreter, when it gets to it, it goes, no idea what this is. If you have something misspelled, a variable name misspelled, and you don't have option explicit, when you get to it, it goes, I don't, know, I don't recognize this variable. My programmer didn't declare it. It's okay, I got it covered. I'll declare it. And at that moment, it declares it as a variant type, and it's just ready to use it. So you, you really do want option explicit there. By the way, if, if it isn't there already, you can change it so it automatically goes there by choosing tools, options, um, require variable declaration. And that next time you create a module, that'll go in automatically. All right, folks, that's the detail on loops. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed. Awesome.